is James Arnold Taylor, voice of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Welcome to a more civilized podcast. This is the podcast you're looking for. You may not go about your business. Stay here, listen, and then move along. Hello there, listeners. Oh, wait, sorry. <laughs> I'm just totally going to roll with this. <laughs> I'm Chris. I'm Kyler. I'm Ross. <laughs> Why do you guys do this to me? <laughs> to be fair, 90% of the time it's me. True. <laughs> like, let's, let's be nice to Kyler. <laughs> yeah. No. What? There's no reason to. I did nothing wrong. Honestly, I just felt like saying hello there. I'm a millicent bystander in all this. <laughs> You've done enough in our history to warrant... <laughs> You're just always guilty. <laughs> yeah. To warrant indiscriminate annoyances. <laughs> Have at thee, sir. Oh, you missed it, Ross. You could have said, you know, uh, one good deed does not... Go unpunished? No, does not, like, uh, redeem a man from, like, a lifetime of crime or whatever. Mm. If you don't remember it, how am I supposed to know? I don't know. Man. Mostly I just wanted to say, but it seems enough to condemn him. Oh, that's witty, right, yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> well, that was an intro. Welcome, listeners. <laughs> Welcome. What the crap is happening with this show? <laughs> yeah. We're podcasters. This is a podcast episode you're listening to right now. Yep. Cool. It is. We if start with stumbled news. stumbled here by accident, we don't blame you for leaving. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what a way to start. Yeah. Yeah. Please enjoy the really rest of Really talking up the quality of the show. Go, Roscoe. Talk about the news. What kind of news? Star, Star Wars, Wars news? news, I would imagine. Chris. I'm you- just kidding. I'm messing with Steven. It's newsy news. <laughs> See what you've done, Steven. No, no more. Make this right. It was great, actually. I got to get Kyler's hopes up, Steven's hopes up, and a Paul Ross just for a moment. I hit all the squares. Well, and I was just going to be disappointed that you had turned again. Which, I mean, would not have been surprising. No, not just at disappointing. all. disappointing. <clears throat> anyway. On to the newsy news. So I guess that's what Steven needs to do if he wants to get rid of me saying newsy news is he needs to frame Ross for something horrible well, <laughs> so that I'll turn on Ross. Okay. We'll work on it. <laughs> Spoiler alert, I probably wouldn't believe it, though. <laughs> <laughs> that could be a fun game. <laughs> Except at my expense, so no, I do not support it. <laughs> See if someone can do something sufficiently horrible to piss me off, but not so horrible that I wouldn't believe it came from Ross. That's a fine line to walk. <laughs> Indeed. Anyway, um, newsy news, Ross. Give us the newsy well, news. And now you have me thinking, now, if I were going to try to make me mad, how would I do it? By being incredibly dumb. But the problem is now I know that all of you know, so if I see that, I will be resistant to it. Ah, but we but know, that that know, know that you know that we know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but now Ross knows that we know that we know. Ah, but does he know that we know that we know that he knows that he knows that I we know? I don't think so. All right, the edge. Is What's back on to first? Us. Who? Newsy news. Who's on second? The newsy news is coming at you. Pause for interruption. Yep. yep okay. Good. Newsy news. I think in this episode about maturity, we've uh, gotten enough of that out of our system. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even think about that. Shoot. All right. So, first up in actors of Star Wars news, we have a recent hot take by Anthony Daniels. Ah, yes. Uh, he was talking to some reporter somewhere. I don't think this article was actually the originator of it, because I want to say I remember actually watching this interview. But anyway, uh, he was talking about how uh, Mark had had a little bit of a tough time with his new series, feeling underutilized. Because, I mean, obviously, the first Mark? movie... Mark? Mark Hamill. Hamill. Yeah. That's oh. how he starts off. Oh, because okay. then he goes on to say, and it's like, yeah, and I felt... That c was something like a glorified lawn decorator, table, yeah, table decoration, decoration yeah, yeah. in the new series. Now, you should know, Anthony Daniels is the world's greatest and largest ham. Yes, he does ham quite well. That man, I swear, is on caffeine constantly. Did you guys see the interview that the Star Wars show Anthony Carboni tried to do with him at, uh, not D23, uh... Celebration? Star Wars Celebration? Mm-mm. Uh-uh. The man did not sit down the entire time, and the interviewer could not get him to focus. <laughs> Absolutely couldn't. He just went on and on about his book and all sorts of other stuff and just couldn't do anything. Also, the Alan Tudyk tells a good story. Hmm. They were in a parade, and Anthony Daniels is talking to him before, because, you know, they're the droids, and so they're, they're usually put next to each other now. And Anthony's like, yeah, don't overdo it, you know, blah, 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 blah. you should be reserved, you know... And, and Alan happened to be in the car in front. 
And so they did the whole thing, did the whole parade. And he turns around and he sees Anthony Daniels standing in his vehicle, big, you know, princess waves and bows and just <laughs> absolutely, you know, eating up the crowd. Anthony has a tendency to embellish everything he does. That's fair. Now, granted, this does, I'm sure, in my in my take, does mean he did feel like he could have done more in those earlier episodes, but it's not as bad as what this article makes it Maybe, sound. yeah. So... I also have noticed that Anthony does not shy away from, I would say, trying to drum up attention so yes. that he can promote his book. Absolutely. I am C-3PO by yes. Anthony Daniels. Yeah. <laughs> so. See, it worked! Oh. Now available. <laughs> that man definitely likes all eyes on him. But he's fun. And I'm sure he gets his, it looks like he's going to get his wish in this new episode. So. Yeah. It's good. Speaking of episode trailer nine, does seem to imply that he'll be. Somewhat Speaking of C-3PO, supposed to be the end of this year, we get 3PO and R2 in Star Wars Legion. Oh, really? Cool. Yep. Cool. So you should go to Dragon's Keep and get it. Cool story. <laughs> cool story, bro. Uh, oh, Ross is so lame. He doesn't play Legion with me. Yeah. I've tried. Yep. So, speaking of episode nine, we've had some comments from J.J. Abrams recently. Hey. In talking about uh, the relationship of episode nine to episode eight. Oh, yes. Uh, long story short... It episode nine, it was not largely derailed at all by episode eight. What Ryan did didn't really change much of what JJ had in mind. Um, but still shocking to me. But okay, not really. But uh, <laughs> what he did say though is that because of some of the things that Ryan did, JJ found himself doing things he wouldn't normally do. So he this he says this wasn't. Basically, he went into episode seven saying, I got to play this safe because a lot of people were burned by the prequels. Yeah. And then Ryan Johnson went into episode eight and said, that's nice. No. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so now JJ's looking at that going more, you know, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna step out, step out of my comfort zone, do some yeah. stuff I wouldn't normally. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Well, and I, I laughed when I saw that because I was like, I, I already said it on the podcast at one point that I'm like 99% sure that that's part of why Ryan Johnson did what he did. It's mm -hmm. just like, okay. Episode 7 was basically a rehash of Episode 4, so I'm going to parallel Episode 5 and 6 in Episode 8 so that you got nowhere else to go. You just <laughs> got to do something new. There will be no rehashing Episode 6 for Episode 9, and which is exactly what I was afraid they were doing when they seemed to be bringing back Palpatine in some way. And so I was happy to see this. Okay. I'm still sure you get the Vader-type repentance from... Kylo, or redemption. I am not convinced. Yeah, I mean, I could see them doing that, but I could also see them uh, see them not. See them not. We'll find out in a month with two of you lucky listeners. Yeah, yeah. for our own contest. Nice, ha, smooth. That was smooth. <laughs> yeah. So make sure you go to the Facebook page, enter in the contest, and come have fun. I think actually this will be the last episode before we draw, isn't it? I believe so. Ooh. Yes. So you have until the end of the month, just a few more days. Yep. Yes. So and uh, yeah. We will sharply be cutting it off at midnight on the last day of... On the first day of December. Midnight, first day of December, yeah. As soon as the clock rolls over and it is officially December, yep. this contest is closed. Correct. Contest is over. We'll that is mountain time. Yes. Mountain time. Yeah. And in other more awesome news, uh, there is an, there was an interesting article published by The Verge on the creating the new world in Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. Hmm. So, uh, we should post that link in the show notes. Um, just talking about how they had to balance uh, what they wanted to do with a game like this and with respecting you know, the source material and trying to create something that felt like Star Wars and how they had all sorts of great ideas and, and you know, just fun stuff. It was a good read. Uh, but I'm not good enough to summarize it. So, also, on Jedi Fallen News Order, we should have, by the time you're listening to this, we will have had two live streams of it. <clears throat> Hopefully with at least some snark provided by me. Yes. Ross told me my job was to get into chat and harass him, so that's what I did. Uh, get into the chat was true. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the harass and harass so you was implied. Mm, nope. <laughs> uh, but for those of you that can't join us live, those will be up on YouTube. Um, yeah. So. I will probably be joining in at some future point on other episodes, but probably not yeah. on this one. I have work. Well, yeah. Anyway. Or I guess that was last the first time, one. so I might be on this next one. 
Well, yeah. and this episode airs after the second time I've played, so hopefully Holy you have been on the last one. I know. Well, uh, uh, Podcasting magic. Yep. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, Chris, you said I you had, had one, one more, more bit of news and news. news. Yes, this yeah. is more of just a little bit of <laughs> awesomeness that I found. So this is this has mild spoilers for the first episode of The Mandalorian, and technically possible for ones that we, as we're recording this, haven't seen yet, but very mild, so I'm not a big deal, but... Um, so this is, uh, regarding the, the, uh, bounty that the Mandalorian went on in that first episode, where at the end he discovered that he was after a baby Yoda. So cute. And apparently, this, this article is about how much Werner Herzog loves baby Yoda. (laughs) Yeah. Speaking to Variety, the actor gushed about the puppet. I have seen it on the set and it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreakingly beautiful and notes that it and he notes that it's a phenomenal technical achievement. And he apparently loves it so much that he would not let them take the puppet away. Wow. Like, so they would so they did <laughs> anim- awesome. mostly puppet puppetry and animatronics for it, but they did some digital work as well. Mm-hmm. And so they would film a, they would film the scenes with the puppet, but then they would film one without the puppet just to get a clean slate for the animators to work with. And apparently when they tried to do that, they would take the the puppet away and he would ask them, what What are you doing? Where are you taking the puppet? <laughs> and, they'd, and they'd explain, it was like, well, we're doing a clean plate for Industrial Light of Magic. And he responded in quotes, you are cowards. Leave it. Leave it. <laughs> wow. So that is how strongly Werner Herzog loves Baby Yoda. Putting his foot down. Yeah. Man. That's awesome. Right? That's pretty cool. I feel about the same way, though. It's freaking adorable. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Like, that's one clear bit of marketing that I'm like, yep, I will buy a plush I will buy that. those plushies, I will buy, yes. yeah, I, yeah, hmm Especially, like, with how my daughter reacted to it, I'm like, yeah, we... We got to find one of those somewhere for Christmas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, that was, I just stumbled across that just before this episode started and was like, well, I'm sticking that in the newsy news. <laughs> That's awesome. And that is the newsy news. All right. So, back to you, Kyler. Yes, back to me because I'm in charge of this episode. Just kidding. I'm lying to every one of you. Uh, Chris is actually <laughs> in charge of this episode. So,. This, uh, we were talking, we've, we've had this idea for a while now, I think. Oh yeah, I had this a while back. So the genesis of this idea for this episode actually came from Batman originally. So mm. I've mentioned before how much I really love Tom King's run on the Batman comic. And uh, after I re- initially encountered it several months ago, read through everything they had, loved it all, particularly like volumes four and five of the trade paperbacks, the War of Jokes and Riddles, and Rules of Engagement. And, uh, but as I was thinking about it at work one day, I was thinking about how much I liked it and the reasons I liked it. And I realized I was like, a lot of the things that I love about that are very similar to things I love about The Last Jedi. And as I got thinking about it, I was like, you know, I bet there's a lot of Batman fans really pissed off about Tom King in exactly the same way that people got pissed off about Ryan Johnson's work. So I pulled up some reviews on, I, I Googled some Tom King's Batman reviews on Google and found that, yep. There's a lot of people uh, voicing the exact same, almost word-for-word word identical complaints. A lot of ruined my childhoods, a lot of doesn't understand these characters, doesn't know what he's doing, ruined the, the direction that Scott Snyder was taking things in the New 52 comics before he took over, etc., etc., etc. Et and uh, But one particular review, the first one I picked up as I was reading it, really struck me because one of the first complaints he had about Tom King's Batman was specifically he said it, how immature they were and that just ground me to a halt mentally i was just sitting here what <laughs> like wh- wh- i'm sorry those are some of the most mature things i've ever seen out of batman like what in the world i was just and he did not elaborate uh often happens in a lot of the reviews that I find where it's just like, yep, I'm going to make this assertion, give you absolutely nothing to back it up, and then just keep repeating that this is a thing, even though I can't explain how it's a thing. I get that a lot. Um, But he, uh, yeah, I had no idea. I couldn't find anything else he said, but I was just sitting there. Uh, Apparently, the man who wrote this review is working from a completely different definition of what makes a work of art mature than I am. And so then, and that's when I got thinking, it's like, I really want to just sit down and discuss what does make a work of art mature? 
Like, what yeah. goes into determining whether something is? Because obviously he and I had completely different definitions, and I kind of wanted to discuss what some people have, what you guys have, what we all yeah, have. Yeah, so. I mean, so this was this was at least six months ago, if not yeah. longer. I specifically wanted to do it after The Mandalorian aired. Yeah. Because I wanted, to, I just so that I could see where it would fit in yeah, the so various... Yeah, this so this has been on our plate for a while, and then we kind of, you know, it got bumped back and bumped back, and then we were looking at some other things, we said, well, you know, after The Mandalorian yeah. airs... That'll be a good time to talk about it because everybody was saying, oh, how dark and gritty and mature the Mandalorian looks from the trailers. And yep. now we have an adorable baby Yoda that people can stop <laughs> talking about. So, uh, <laughs> but to be fair, that same episode, we get, you know, him actually disintegrating people. So there's yep. that. Uh, but anyway, so we are going to uh, let Chris just have his run of the place for well, this episode. Well, I, I got some questions I wanted to ask. Yeah. I, you know, I just wanted to open up to you. That's the main question. I did want to start with a quote. And, like, a little caveat here that I'm... Well, here, this is a quote from C.S. Lewis. Now, I, in one of our very first episodes, I I mentioned this quote, and just the last line of it. And now I'm going to give you the full quote, because it is... I, I love this quote. And it What's is... What's it from? I don't know, actually. I've been meaning to look that up. I do know that it is C.S. Lewis. I just got it off okay. of Goodreads, so... Um, critics who treat adult as a term of approval instead of as a merely descriptive term cannot be adults themselves. To be concerned about being grown up, to admire the grown up because it is grown up, to blush at the suspicion of being childish, these things are the marks of childhood and adolescence. And in childhood and adolescence, they are, in moderation, healthy symptoms. Young things ought to want to grow. But to carry on into middle life or even into early manhood, this concern about being adult is a mark of really arrested development. When I was ten, I read fairy tales in secret and would have been ashamed if I had been found doing so. Now that I am fifty, I read them openly. When I became a man, I put away childish things, including the fear of childishness and the desire to be very grown up. <laughs> now, I love this quote. And the reason I bring it up here at the beginning of this is partly... There's two reasons. One is that... I want to clarify that when I'm describing something as less adult or less mature, that is not an attack. Like, there's very much a difference for me between something being less mature or not mature. You're using it as a descriptor rather yeah. than a well, and it, there's term a different quality. Yeah, and there's a difference between not mature or less mature and immature. You know, where yes. immature literally means that something is less mature than it should be. And when it comes to art, there is very rarely a level of maturity that something should have. And, you know, it might vary depending on the content that you're addressing and et cetera, et cetera. But generally speaking, a work of art can be as mature as it wants to be. And, hey, it's no big deal. And if you like something that is less mature or not that mature or that is not a reflection in any bad way on you, that's fine. I love plenty. I mean, we've had plenty of discussions about how much we like My Little Pony. And that is... <laughs> that's on this podcast. <laughs> definitely, yes. That is hardly the most mature thing out there. Yeah. And so th this is not an attack on anyone's tastes well, is what and I'm getting at. Shoot, I mean, I so Disney Plus is still relatively a new yeah. thing, you know, and I, well we mentioned last week first thing I watched on Disney Plus was The Mandalorian because that's what I was most excited for and then the very next thing we watched um my wife and I watched an episode of um Rescue Rangers which was a cartoon that we both loved oh, growing man. up. Is that on there? Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> and then we watched an episode of Kim Possible. And then the next morning, we watched an episode, uh, oh, we showed the girls Recess when they got home the next day. We watched, like, four episodes of the TV show Recess, yep. which, while intended for kids, is incredibly clever. Much in the same way that My Little Pony is, there's tons yep. of um, very witty and clever humor that is intended for the adults that are inevitably watching this with their children, yep. or 20 years later on Disney+, Plus because they're adults and they can. Yep. Um, <laughs> you know. And then in between those things, you went to work and took care of your family because you are a functioning adult, and right, none exactly. of this reflects in any better way on that. Yeah, you know, and it's just, yeah, but yeah. when I was like, you know, these, these are good stories. Oh, and so then while I was at work, because I work at a comic shop, uh, he's got a TV there, the owner does, you know, to have different cool nerdy things that people might be interested in playing, you know, just for nice background stuff. And I was like, I'm going to put on Gargoyles because that was a show that I liked and I remember had a cool story. Let's see if it holds up. And it kind of does. I mean, obviously not perfectly because yeah, it yeah. is a children's Very show. Very few but, things do. <laughs> but I'm going overall though, this was a really pretty well done show. Yeah. Yep. 
And then and the second. I sec- still kind of want to be Goliath. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. Watching that show again, I was like, oh, yes. I remember why I pretended to be Goliath as a child. He's so cool. <laughs> Oh. And then the second reason I bring up that quote is mostly just because this um, fear slash embarrassment about not being seen as adult, I, I'll get into more later once we've discussed some of the other stuff, but it's I feel like it is an enormous factor in how our society defines what is and is not mature. And that yeah. there are a lot of people that are out there operating under this fear of not being seen as mature. And, and that that drives a lot of how we dictate, no, this is mature, this isn't mature, this isn't, this isn't, this is okay for adults. And I really don't think it should. And so I wanted to start with that. So I was like, hey, I'm going to refer to this later. Just Fair enough. But right now, the question of the day is, so what makes a work of art mature? Yeah, that's... I don't know, like, how to... I know what's going to happen on this show is I'm going to stumble through trying to express myself, and then Chris is going to say yeah. what I tried, what I was trying <laughs> to get trying at. I'm trying not to have it be that, but I mean, I have had months of this bouncing around in my head. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> well, see, and I was just thinking, I, yes, this episode's been on the set list for forever, but uh, I didn't even think about it till today. Yeah. So I haven't had a chance it's, to even think about this I mean, question you beforehand. Would, I don't know. When I think about things that are considered quote unquote mature, but that's probably shows that are in the mature category that Chris is talking about because these are things that should be for adults. You know, they tend to be more violent yep. and okay, show so, more of the violence. So content here, yeah. yeah. There's adult content, right? Yeah. You've got violence, you got sex, you've got swearing. Yeah. you got substance use of all sorts. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that, I guess, comes to mind. Because, um, like, you're not going to see those things like you're gonna see really toned down violence and that's about it in like my little pony for example yes you know and even something that is intended for an older audience like kim possible again all of these disney plus shows on my mind <laughs> um you know kim possible was for like your like 11 to 14 ish you know yeah, very much my little pony ages. is kind of like five or six to about 11 or 12 you know yeah um Tim Possible, you're going to see a little bit worse violence, but you're still not going to see sex. Yep. You're still not going to see substance abuse. Um, like, <laughs> speaking of that, the there was an episode I just watched today, because I'm still watching Kim Possible with my wife, and uh, her Kim Possible's parents end up being chaperones on the school trip, and they start seeing 99 bottles of beer on the wall, but they change it to 99 bottles of pop. <laughs> <laughs> like soda pop, you know? Yeah. And it's, I was just like, oh, well... Yeah, I guess this is technically a kid's show, even though, like, it's this totally innocuous song yeah. that, like, everybody knows the song. It doesn't mean anything at all, but we still can't say beer because that would be inappropriate yep. for children, you know? So Which, that I is mean, definitely... I, I, do, I agree with that. Yeah, that, yeah, but, yeah. But nonetheless, it, I think it definitely illustrates that idea of there are things that should be for adults and things that should be for kids, and yeah. nary the twain shall yeah. meet. I would argue, and and I was, yeah, that's one that I had on my list here, and I was like, I'd say there is a difference, definitely, between being inappropriate for kids and being mature, mm-hmm. because those yeah, are those yeah, are all things that good... we don't want to give to kids. They are, see, because that's, I have discussed this with one or two people just in prep for this, and that's always one that comes up pretty quick. It was my, one of my first thoughts when I started thinking about this. Yeah. And, and then, but then as I thought a bit further, I was like, well, but you can do all of those things with extreme immaturity. Yeah. Like we've all seen movies or yeah. shows that are going to address sex in ridiculously immature ways. Yeah. I mean, 99% of video games, if they're addressing sex at all, it's in an immature yeah. way. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Like yeah. you look at Duke Nukem or something, oh, or even, yeah. even the Witcher has you collecting like scantily clad or unclad cards of the various women you conquest throughout the game. Yeah. Like, this is a supposedly mature game, but that's really not a mature approach to yeah. sex at all. Yeah, you wouldn't see a mature person in real life being like, hey, do you mind if I take a scantily clad picture of you for my collection? Yeah, like, for my spank bank. Like, it's yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's an inappropriate, uh, immature way of exactly <laughs> celebrating that, I guess. <laughs> so, so, And I- then I, I, have, I have a similar thing with swearing that often gets on my nerves, where it's just like, there's a lot of people, when it t- comes to sex or violence or swearing... You, you get a lot of shows where having those at all is like they're trying if they're, it's a comedy like that is the funny it's like oh we swore tee hee hee isn't that hilarious mm-hmm. and I'm like no it's not 
This was my problem with the first Deadpool movie, is I was just like, this movie is either being crass or it is being funny. It is rarely doing both. Like, the crassness has nothing to do with the humor. It's yeah. not funny. It's just sticking it in there and then being like, oh, isn't that funny? And I'm like, no, that's immature. Like, that is an immature yeah. approach to crassness. Where, and I would compare it with, uh, I think it was Melissa McCarthy's Spy came out the same year or the year before. And it was freaking hilarious. Like, I watched that. It was rated R. It was extremely They're crass. They're actually a, a great example of um, really well done crassness <laughs> is Monty Python's Life of Brian. Yes, yes. Particularly when they start talking about his friend in Rome, P- Pilate's friend in Rome, Biggest Dickus. Yes. That whole scene, extremely crass, but also absolutely witty and clever and hilarious. Yeah. It, there, are, there are some people who know how to use all that to good effect, and there's some people who just laugh because it's there. And I would say yeah. the one is definitely more mature than the other. And that's how I got with Spy, where I was laughing at it, and I felt bad for laughing, because I was like, I should not be laughing at that. That's horrible. <laughs> like, that is so disgusting. But it's hilarious. Whereas Deadpool, I was just like, well, that's disgusting. Oh, and that was funny. There we go. Like, they never crossed. And... Yeah. Sorry, what were you saying, Russ? Well, now I've had two thoughts. Sweet. The first one is kind of meta. Am mm. I going to have to mark this episode mature? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think we've crossed any I wasn't planning on lines. getting into anything, yeah, too... Yeah, too raunchy. Because I mean, normally we've just stayed away from it and not had to worry about where the line is. I don't actually know where that is. I don't know. We'll find <laughs> out. Uh, and then the other thought was so I was still trying to answer your question before as to what is mature media. Mm-hmm. Um, so my first thought is, well, what makes a, a, a person mature, right? Let's find out what. Yeah, what, awesome. Where where to start from there, and maybe we can actually relate it to the media. So. Um, Generally, my definition of a mature individual is someone that can put uh, responsibilities or needs before wants, right? Yeah. Like, like I think the meme is usually something like, "Oh, I made a dentist appointment today. Look, everyone, I'm adulting." Yes. Right? Which I mean, that's a meme, but that's that's true. If you legitimately actually are are taking care of yourself to do a thing that you don't want to do for your own benefit, that is the sign of a mature yeah. individual. Um, but as far as that sort of thing applies to like media, movies, or music, or anything, it's a little bit tougher connection to make. Um, yeah. I, I would say, now, I think you could relate yeah. to that, that a lot of people take approach an approach of, if it's mature, it has to be about an issue. It has to be addressing something serious. It has to be... So, and That kind of goes, I was going to say, like, again, trying to, because this is a weird thing to try yeah. to define, especially yeah. for me and Ross, like, where we haven't been thinking about this yes. particular episode for months. Um, I was sitting here thinking, like, you know, when you have nuanced characters that aren't quite so, like, okay, so we were watching X Men on Disney Plus. <laughs> you know, Wolverine is a little bit flat. He's just real angry all the time <laughs> at everybody, and is always just being like, "Hey, bub, you know, brr, yeah. I'm gonna give you these claws." Like, that's there's not really much more to him than that. Yep. You know, and it's like, okay, you know, this is a show meant for boys, so. Gratuitous well, and the comics, violence and that's part funny. of why he was so popular in the comics is because he was kind yeah. of a one note and like so, teenager's ideal. Of, yeah, and so in yeah. my mind, I'm like, okay, so I can see where that's for kids, where because kids are dumb, you know, they they don't, uh, they're not as analytical as adults are, and so they they're fine with, hey, Wolverine, he's got claws that come out and he's killing stuff. Cool. I don't need anything more than that. Yep. And I started thinking, okay, so you know, I like you know characters that uh, are more three dimensional that may have different shades of morality, that may have different motivations for their actions and things like that, that would be more mature. And then I was like, well, but I've also seen enough My Little Pony to know that, that is, those elements are present in My Little Pony, so is My Little Pony for adults, because that really deep character development, I mean, that's present Yep. there. Well, and, and yet that is a show that is for kids. Yeah, yeah. and on top of that, I was thinking of other cartoons you would see as kids and every so often you'd hit an episode and in the beginning of the episode they'd have a black screen and white text and you like some of the the topics discussed in today's yeah. episode may be you know sensitive to those blah blah blah, blah that whole disclaimer yeah. and then like it might be an episode where uh some some kid or some high schooler is contemplating suicide and they 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 discuss that problem and and however it resolves i tend to i if it's done right, I tend to think of those as mature episodes because not because they are dealing with a serious topic, but because they are also discussing the appropriate reaction of 
of ways to both deal with the consequences of maybe a suicide or something like that, but also how to maybe manage yourself or others so they don't get to that point, which seems to be a more mature... Well, yeah, sure, absolutely. but by that definition, itself. then like Sesame Street. Well, and here, yeah, let me, you know what I mean. Well, and I'll put, I'll put yeah. this out here now, just as is. I think it'll be handy. There's also the fact that maturity is not a single attribute that mm-hmm. a show either has or yeah. has it. You can be mature in some ways and less mature in other right. ways. And so, like some of the examples I jotted it's down, it's almost like maturity is a complex issue. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> it's not an all or nothing. It's um, almost like that. <laughs> so I put like. If you look at Phantom Menace, or really the prequels okay. in general, you've got really immature humor. Yes. Especially with Jar Jar in the first yeah. one. Mm-hmm. You've got often oversimplified, unrealistic um, romance, plot points, like a whole lot of stuff that just comes... The, a lot of the dialogue comes across as kind of silly, kind of immature, yeah. n- unrealistic, that sort of thing. And but you've got this contrasted with some pretty deep and complex political and social issues. Yeah. You've yeah. got you know you you've got those contrasted with this like decaying facade of like long established institutions and how they become complacent over time. Slavery, freaking Hitler and sci fi drag. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This, this is all some pretty serious stuff. But there, it's a mix, and and sometimes you can have a good mix, something that works pretty well, even though you know it's like maturity level is high here and low here, and that works just fine. Or it can be rather atonal, like in the Phantom Menace, yeah. where it's like, yeah, we're high here but low here, and it doesn't work. Yeah. So my Hershey little pony Chris for asking these hard <laughs> questions. And so, like you were saying with My Little Pony, I would say My Little Pony is mature in a lot of its themes and the way it yeah. addresses issues, where that's part of what it's doing is teaching kids to look. This is how you solve these things as a grown-up. Instead right. of flying off your handle, you talk to the other person and work something out. Yeah. You know, it's like the Lego movies are some of my favorite examples, where it's just mm-hmm. like, these are extremely silly. Like, they're extremely goofy. They're all they're, they're not about taking many things seriously. But if you look at, like, Lego Batman, this is very much about how, okay, Batman's fun and all, but you know, actually developing yourself into a person who can have relationships and connect with other people one-on-one and as a group and as a family and opening yourself up to that is actually more mature than being really gritty and lonery. Like, yeah. and, and that's, that's a good message. That's a mature message, mm-hmm. even if it is wrapped in a lot of silliness, that's not necessarily as mature. It's true. And I mean, the, that's, <laughs> this is literally the know, entire topic of the second Lego movie <laughs> is yeah. that's what it is about. <laughs> is about, hey, you can be mature and still be imaginative or childish or silly or have fun. Like, you know, you've got all the characters sitting like here like, no, we have to be grim and gritty. We're brooding right now, Emmett. And Emmett <laughs> just can't handle it and thinks he needs to become that. And the whole point of the message is surpri- of the movie is surprise. No, he doesn't. Mm-hmm. Jeez, Chris, way to spoil the movie. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I haven't seen it yet. Come on, Chris. You haven't seen it, no. Ross? Go watch it, man. Sorry. I haven't seen it yet either. You haven't? Neither of you no, have seen it? No, I want to. I just oh, haven't. Is it well, on I'm Disney sorry, Plus? I didn't know. No, it probably is not on <laughs> Disney Plus. Wait, who owns it? I don't know. That's, I'm, I'm going to look. You can get it. it from the library. That's where I got it for my boys to watch. And it is solid. Anyway, that aside. It's not quite as good as the first Lego movie, but it is... I liked it. I liked it quite a lot. Yeah. So yeah, you can have both. Um, so we can address that with a lot of these things, but what, what makes the maturity? So we mean like there's content that's not appropriate for kids and there's a mature outlook in how you deal with problems. I say would be one. Like I, if we're teaching people, if we're I showing so. adults being adults, I like in, in, uh, order of the stick. One of my favorite moments is, uh, when you have nail and the others at the pyramid. And, and so these are the bad guys and you have two that have just joined the group that are older than the others and they get in a fight where the one is just screaming at the other one in his face about like, no, you do not do this. You are disrespecting me, but, and you are just, mm-hmm. you are, you are taking advantage of the situation for your own gain. And, and you've got the, the, one of the characters standing in the background, just being like, Shh, we get to watch them get into it. This is going to be great. But then instead the character just goes, you are absolutely right. Like I have been being insensitive and selfish. I am so sorry. I, I will do my best not to do that anymore. Let's, you know, I, I am sorry, and I will try and make it up to you in the future. Thank you. I appreciate you saying so. I appreciate the apology. Let's keep going. And then the other bad guys are sitting here like, well, who wants to read that? Like, that's <laughs> yeah. no fun. This is ridiculous. 
and but but it is it is that a lot i i relish watching things often that that instead of going for cheap drama will go okay let's show adults being adults and you know instead of the the traditional like romantic misunderstanding yeah because we just won't communicate in any way we'll we'll come up with a story where people can communicate and still have drama like and you know be functioning yeah. adults and it's particularly noticeable when you read like something super YA when you haven't in a long time and you all of a sudden are like whoa man I thought some of the adult things were bad but no I forgot how bad it could get <laughs> like I pulled Smallville out the other day oh. I was on YouTube and there's a random clip from Smallville and I was like Smallville I haven't watched that in like 15 years oh let's watch that clip holy crap this is hyper dramatic oh my word wow yeah there's a lot of shows like that. Yep. I'll catch my wife watching. And I say catch my wife watching because it is kind of like a guilty pleasure for yeah, her. Yeah. Like she, well, and it's she still does like, get a little embarrassed. I remember loving Smallville, and I'll still watch clips of it and just be like, oh, yeah, yeah, that was fun. Wow, but I cringe at some of the dialogue these days. Like, I just yeah. can't sit through it. Anyway. Yeah. But, okay, so content. We've got the mature Goodness. situations, mature behavior. Which is not necessarily inappropriate for kids. It's actually great to show kids examples of that. I mean, nobody's going to call um, Mr. Rogers immature. Like, yeah. Mr. Toots probably Rogers. way ahead of most adults in his maturity. So. <laughs> I I would say not probably. He, he is, is definitely. definitely. <laughs> <laughs> he is a defining example of maturity. Yes. Yeah. Um, oh, man. That, ooh, that... Mr. Rogers is actually a great example of this. I can't believe I didn't think of this before, but not being condescending. Mm. So even though Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood is a show for kids, he is never condescending when talking to the audience, you know, ever. Yeah. He's very much like, well, you're here to learn and I'm here to teach, so let, let's let do those things. Yeah, let's talk. And here we go. Let's talk, you know, let me explain this to you. But he's never like, oh, well, you're just a kid, so... Like, you know, and sometimes... The attitude that I am so much above children is itself quite immature. Yeah. Yes. You know, and sometimes, like, movies or TV series will almost feel that way, where, like, usually, I guess, in dialogue or something, where they, like, really oversimplify explanations, and it's like, oh, look, I'm not, I'm not completely stupid. I have been watching the movie. You know, yeah. <laughs> like, you didn't need to really rehash that you know like it's funny when michael scott does it when he's like okay explain <laughs> it to me like i'm five you know like okay but you know that's being self-aware and stuff but like do you know what i mean like sometimes yeah. movies are that way or tv shows are that way where it's a little they expect little too little of their audience yeah, yeah. and uh, i mean writing that is it's it's tricky to pull off with any age group actually yeah. just respecting your audience and trusting them to follow what you're saying is hard like it's hard to trust your audience to pick up what you're doing yeah. And yeah. And even even writing for adults that can be very tricky. Like it's weird. It's really weird when you get in there and you're like, "Holy crap, am I being condescending? Like am I over explaining <laughs> things here? Are, are we the baddies? Are we the baddies?" Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to think of a bad example of that and my girls much to my chagrin love Pokémon, <laughs> which I think is terribly written and really dumb. But I a lot of times like just having the the little bit that I've seen sort of passively from it and stuff and I'm not I'm not invested in the story you know, you're talking about the shows not the yeah, yeah yeah the yeah. movies yeah um cuz they like collect were like collecting pokemon cards cuz their friends were at school and mm -hmm. then they found right. out that pokemon was also a tv series and they want to watch that and literally everything else yeah, yes. yeah exactly yeah. and so uh it's not like I'm particularly invested in the story, but even I was aware of what was going on. And then the characters will literally tell you the thing that you just watched. Yeah. And I'm just like, I'm not Which retarded. Which can be appropriate like, for kids, yeah, but well, sometimes. But, no, but it was, it was, there was, I don't even know what the episode was about the other day, but they were like, literally, like, one Pokemon is fighting another one, and then, like, gets hurt or something. Like, the bad guys say, like, you know, our Pokemon use this attack then you see it use that attack and then the good guys are like oh no the bad pokemon used this attack and uh, it's yeah. like i heard it the first time and then i saw it yep. you don't need to say it like really that is a good like, example do you of think doing that, that i'm much, stupid yeah. 
are, like, is your audience that dumb? You know, and it and, was like that. And you like know, sometimes you I can be too obtuse at the same time. There, There is an opposite to that, where it's like, one of my favorite animes is called Darker Than Black. And, but it is one where it's like, it does not hold your hand. Like, it does, it just expects you to pick up what is happening. And it was even worse because I apparently watched it out of order originally and I didn't even realize it. You know And what? so it was just like, holy crap, what's going on? Well, but see, I loved it. That because, was my problem with Final Fantasy XIII is that it just didn't tell you anything. Yeah. It would give all these random words that they had made up that were just in the context of the game, but with no explanation yeah. of what they were. And it's one of those things that's tough to explain to people as an editor or something where it's like, no, you're not explaining enough to hear. No, I don't want you to over-explain, mm -hmm. but you do need more than this, and finding where that line is, and it, it can be very difficult. And sometimes, you know, the best thing to do is to just go, no, screw it. I trust my audience. They'll figure it out. If they don't want to figure it out, they can go read something else. <laughs> <laughs> I, sometimes that's just what you have to do, but see, I don't know. I I think that's all my brain has now. I'm just waiting for. The... So what about dark grittiness? Like, oh, dark and gritty. That 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 broody. Like, there's definitely some dark. There are things that I don't want my sons watching specifically because of that atmosphere of like this is very grim. This is very bleak. This is very. Wait, gritty you don't or want dark. them to watch Punisher? <laughs> no, no, I don't. I don't. Oh, but even something not even like violent like Punisher, but like uh, the one anime. Uh, to Miyazaki, the one about the fire, Grave of the Fireflies. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, Something of the Fireflies. Yeah, man, my mind's blanking on it. But yeah, that one can be pretty intense. It's, it's super heavy. Yeah, uh, it's heavy. But that's the thing is there. there's no real violence. It's just all serious topics and nothing ever going right for the main characters. Yeah. The, the tragedy of the purest form. You know, that's... Mm -mm, I don't even think I was ready and I was in high yeah. school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's... Well, and that's the thing, too. It's also often hard to judge, like, how much can kids handle? Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I look back on the stuff I watched when I was young and I was like, apparently I was fine. I mean, ish. <laughs> well, uh, I might not be the best Hold example, on, Chris but... <laughs> might have just proved a different point. <laughs> yes, yeah, I may have just undercut myself. Um, but no, I mean, kids can handle a lot of things. Like, I, you know, I, I look at the Star Wars movies, for instance, and how young I was watching those just left and right as much as I could, and I was fine, you know? And, and I mean, they're hardly the most grim and gritty at all, yeah. the original trilogy, or, or really anything Star Wars we have yet. But, but at the same time, you know, there's some parts that it's like Vader turning out to be Luke's father that just hit my son hard, like he's a sensitive soul. And, and for me, that was just like, oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, as far as I remember, there's, I don't remember my first instance of that, but I don't remember it bothering me either, you know? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, because there's, I don't know, when we think dark and gritty, there's usually the literal visual darkness. Yeah. So, like, Daredevil, Punisher on Netflix, you know, like, those are actually, like, literally the lighting is dark yeah. in those, you know? So there is that. But I it, it also, I think, sets that tone that yeah. we're trying to say, well... You know, this is dark and gritty, is so we're going up. to show you that it's actually dark. So, I, mean, I don't mean to derail, but I'm thinking no, I'm trying good. to answer the question of, as far as tone and maturity, I suppose would that would that come down to what the audience is able to process? So, okay. such as, like, again, talking about the Firefly one, whatever it's called, um, you wouldn't show that to a child because they just couldn't really fully grasp in a, in a healthy way what is being presented possibly right? yeah where those of us that are adults understand you know the realities of life and that this is what this is happening you know you, you can as much as it is soul crushing you still get it yeah right and it doesn't kind of sit on you and it doesn't it doesn't have an adverse effect on you as an adult whereas as a kid it might you don't know how they're going to process it. you don't know if they're going to dwell on yeah. it you don't know if it's going as to a parent sort of i definitely try to manage what my son is being exposed to like mm -hmm. not because he can't handle it per se but just because I don't want to make it any more difficult than life right. has to be in the first place. You right. know, it's... <laughs> I was going to say, like, uh, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it just order the stick, like, you know, druids always choose the hard way. It's like, it encourages, <laughs> I, yeah, it encourages natural, natural selection. It's like, <laughs> I show my kids the hardest stuff I can find. <laughs> I want to toughen them up, which is, of course, not true, but. Sorry. Well, and everybody Jump does fell. have a different approach to that, you know. It's yeah. like I got brother and sister in law who are very, like, very, like, no, we don't, we don't have PG thirteen rated movies in the house. We don't do this, that, or the other. Got, you know, I know a couple people that are like that, and I'm like, okay, cool. I let my sons watch some PG thirteen rated stuff. Others, I don't. For me, it's partly easier because I consume so much media that, or and and then I consume so much media about media 
that if I've I'd, if my sons want to watch something or play something or do something, I've probably watched or read or played that game or whatever, or I've read about it. I know roughly what contents in it. So managing media for my sons is easier for me than I think it is for a lot of people. Yeah. I can see why they might take a more extreme approach. I'm not necessarily as concerned with that because I know what I am letting my kids watch. Mostly. <laughs> There's some surprises occasionally. <laughs> Walk in and you're like, whoa, hey, what, what's that? What is that? Nope. Let's turn YouTube off. Thank you. <laughs> YouTube. It's kind of like a minefield. Yes. That's mostly been emptied. Yes. But sometimes. <laughs> But YouTube kids, that's why it's better. Yes. Well, that. even that was a thing. Yeah, yeah, like, last yeah. year was a whole huge thing. Yeah, yeah there's always some. Um, let's see. So, yeah, the the darker... And, and darker can also be a difficult thing to judge. Like, yeah. you know, I, I watched Rogue One and I was like, this isn't dark. Yeah. This isn't dark at all. Like, where other a lot of people were like, oh, yeah, this is so much darker and grimmer. And I was like, mm, I'm not getting that. Like, it's not Game of Thrones by any means. Like... And even Game of Thrones is not the darkest grimace that I've watched or read. Like, so I don't know where you know how do you determine that? But I I often think the the darkness it's it's a it's a lev- it's kind of how it's used. It's like with the other adult content or whatever this tone and everything. It's are you using this to good effect? Do you know what you're doing with that? Like my my favorite examples are like Watchmen and the Dark Knight Returns in comics. So these are. Frank Miller and Alan Moore uh, swap that around Alan Moore and Frank Miller respectively and uh, they were very influential comics when they hit in the 80s and they're very very dark very grim very serious like take on superheroes and superhero dumb uh, the Watchmen and Batman respectively uh, but I find that but so then they spawned a whole bunch of imitators after that and they're like, oh yeah, this is really popular. We all really like this. It's really affecting and cool. So you've got all these imitators that are imitating, aping this dark and gritty attitude. It was Comics were really well known for in the late 80s and the mid 90s. Really grungy and dark and grim. And this is where Wolverine came from. And, but the problem was that for a lot of it, like those original comics were in a lot of ways satire. Like Watchmen is specifically deconstructing like superheroes and going like, here are the ways in which superheroes are unrealistic and why that's good and where it's not good and what this would be like if we had it in the real world and why you don't want to make superhero comics more gritty. And that's the same thing Batman the the Dark Knight Returns was. It wasn't, look how grim and dark this is, isn't that cool? It was, look how ridiculous and awful this is. Why would we should never do this? Like, this is what we should not be doing. But there are so many people that especially teenagers that kind of took that and went, oh, look, that's so cool, and just ran with the aesthetic without <laughs> understanding the purpose behind it. That, And so it, you, you kind of got this weird, you know, it's the, it became very immature in a lot of ways. What, Chris? You're telling me that young people took something that they didn't understand <laughs> fully and ran with it thinking it was a good idea? Yeah, thinking it that's was That's ridiculous. Really, well, <laughs> thinking it was mature, and that's, it's kind of that attitude of, like, a lot of teenagers have that attitude of, like, okay, I want to... I want to seem grown up, which is fine. Like, you know, like the C.S. Lewis quote said, in childhood and adolescence, that's a healthy symptom. They should want to grow. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be and or seem adult as a child or a kid or a teenager. But the problem is that teenagers tend to lack the wisdom and experience to discern what really is mature and what just seems mature because it's not appropriate for kids. Mm -hmm. And so you get a lot of things like that where it's like, oh yeah, we've got all this stuff that's really dark and gritty, but without the maturity that went behind that. Because the the people consuming it don't necessarily know the difference between those. That's actually one of my like less generous opinions about um, Zack Snyder's work in the DC Universe, is which there's, I've got a lot of less generous opinions there, but um, one of the personally like more ad hominem <laughs> less generous opinions is that I feel like Zack Snyder is a person who though he is an adult has never grown into an understanding of the purpose behind that dark and gritty grimness and so when he's making an adaptation of Watchmen into a movie or when he's adapting elements of The Dark Knight Returns into Batman v Superman he's doing it without the understanding of why those were there in the first place and what those meant for you know, for, for a mature lesson and what they were saying. And so all he's got is this veneer of grimness that isn't actually mature. 
So. Oh boy, there's the quote for the episode. A veneer <laughs> of grimness that isn't actually mature. <laughs> Ooh, I've got a lot of veneers. So, for me, as I've been thinking about this for a while, I came down to one specific category that I feel like is kind of the hallmark by which people gauge whether or not something is mature, for better or worse. Like, sometimes I feel like it is a very useful attribute to gauge by, other times less so. And that is realism. Does it seem real? The more real it is... Like, I've I've said several times, just we've been discussing it, like when I was criticizing the Phantom Menace's problems, it's like, part of the problem with, say, Anakin and Padme's romance is that it's not real. That's mm-hmm. not what romance is like. That is like a child's understanding of what romance is like. Yes. Yeah. And, or like a, a very young teenager's understanding of how a, a, a tragic romance is supposed to go. Like, you know, the... And so, <laughs> it, it's that's what makes it seem less mature. And the is Anakin's that, lines are very much like what oh yeah an emo like distraught oh you know heartbroken teenager would say to the girl he likes yeah you know? they might think like oh this would be romantic wouldn't it and it's like well and some girls do think like that's a lot of younger girls do think that's what that's actually what watching Smallville that Smallville was for me I was like it's not that this is unrealistic per se. It's that it's hyper-realistic portrayal of how teenagers think they're supposed to act as adults. Yeah, the overdramatic ones. Yeah. yeah, and so it's like you've got... I remember doing that as a teenager. I remember seeing a whole lot of that where it's just like, oh, I should be mature about this, so I'll be really dramatic about it. <laughs> this is very serious. You don't understand how much you've made me distraught. And it's just like, no, oh, like, oh, no, that wasn't maturity. That was That was someone who didn't understand maturity imitating the trappings of maturity and and that's what smallville is that's what a lot of the dialogue in the prequels is which is harsh because that's george and george was obviously an adult at the time yeah. so sorry george but <laughs> that's what you wrote <laughs> um but the thing i like about the realism is that it explains a lot of arbitrary standards that people have for what is mature or is not that I feel, at least that I feel, are arbitrary. So you've got, like, live action over animation or puppetry, Dark Crystal fans. Um, You you know, you've got a ton of people that are just like, well, it's live action, that clearly makes it better. Like, I feel like that's the driving force behind people being like, yay, Disney live action remakes, is that it's like this attitude of, now it's okay for me to like this again. Like, I've always liked it. Yeah, I can't like the Clone Wars or Rebels, that's for kids, but because it's Mandalorian. Which, to be fair, those are more child-oriented. They are, but narratively and especially at those later yeah. seasons sure of and the, but Can like they? i just i recently came across the episode on mandalore where ahsoka's teaching the cadets and then a couple of the cadets are like oh yeah we need to be like politically active and holding our leaders to responsibility let's go investigate the warehouse and there conveniently happens to be yeah. neruduel's go- meeting in the warehouse at the exact moment they arrive and and, and it's like well, none of that is realistic it's like baby's first political activism example and that's what makes it more immature is that it isn't realistic it's it's simplistic mm-hmm. and so like this isn't a wholly flawed standard i feel like like i i actually when i originally came up with this idea of like oh yeah realism is what most people use i was like they shouldn't that's bad and then i watched that episode just like last week and i was like oh yeah this is this is one of those clone wars episodes that really reminds you that this is for kids like, we do definitely get into more mature stuff and have arcs that are more, you know, more realistic and everything, but it's this, but this one is much more for kids, and I was like, wait, why? Why? Hey, I'm doing it, I'm doing a podcast on this next week. I should pay attention. <laughs> why is this? And I, and I, as I got looking at it, I was like, well, it's just that this is so simplistic. This isn't what's real. This isn't how real I, oh no. I've been dissing on this in my head for so long and all of a sudden I realize that's what I'm doing here and it's a valid critique. Like, <laughs> it is valid to say that this is not realistic and that's a problem. It is immature because of that. Dang it. Really threw me. So, <laughs> I'm, glad I, I'm glad I got to that episode last week because otherwise this would be a very different podcast. Hmm. But So, live action over animation. I have always held that that is utterly arbitrary. Yeah. Like, in, you know, you go to Japan, yeah. you go to anime, they do not have this attitude that animation is just for kids very much so mm-hmm. and with part of what's so jarring for a lot of people picking up anime where they think oh it's animated so it's for kids <laughs> nope well and i think another great example of that is avatar the last airbender yeah you know animated show geared towards children but it is one of the best most mature stories absolutely like, and especially like that that last season with zuko and his growth and everything it's like 
tell me so there aren't adults in your life that couldn't use a good season of this to teach them some things. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. we're all better people because of Uncle Iroh. You know? <laughs> but I think part of what draws people towards live action is more acceptable for adults, aside from, you know, 90 years of Disney in, in their heads. Yeah, but exactly. Is is just this, the, this idea that because it's live action, it's more realistic, therefore it's more adult. Yeah. Period. End of story. Despite the fact that I really doubt that anyone would hold up all sorts of live action movies like, oh, what am I? Uh, I should like The Hangover is not exactly the most mature movie ever. No. You know, no, like yeah. things like that. You know, they're not that mature. I'm not going to put The Hangover on a higher level of maturity. Definitely a higher level of not being appropriate for kids. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to put that on a higher level of maturity than say, Grave of the Fireflies, or you know, basically anything from Studio Ghibli. Yeah. So, you know. I don't. I've, I've always felt that's arbitrary. Um, nonfiction over fiction, or fiction over science fiction and fantasy, like each of those is progressively less real, quote unquote. And I feel like that's why a lot of people look down their nose at science fiction and fantasy because it's like, oh, well, that's not real though. Therefore, it's clearly not as mature. And but I like, would say, look at Lord of the Rings. I mean, exactly. Tell me there aren't awesome mature messages in that. Absolutely. That you don't see in Weekend at Bernie's. Yep. You know, or see, and it's interesting because the only way they'll start going, oh, okay, Pearl it Harbor. Can be oh, mature. wait, sorry, I meant to use an example of real movies. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but I and see, and with uh, with Tolkien, I particularly like because you know there is a lot of fantasy that people will be like, oh yeah, yeah, that's mature fantasy, like George R. R. Martin, and partly because oh, we're stuffing it full of sex and violence and swearing and all of this other stuff, gratuitously in some cases, and and so therefore it is now mature. And it's like, no, that's not what makes something mature. What makes Game of Thrones mature is its extremely realistic portrayal and expose, basically, this, like, it's delving into the parts of fantasy literature that are often unrealistic yeah. and are not addressed in a real way. You know, it, Tolkien is extremely mature, but at the same time, you know, all his good guys live, all his bad guys survive. It's, you know, that's a very basic trope that is very much not true to life. You mean all his bad guys don't survive? Yeah, sorry flip that um but but that doesn't make him immature that doesn't make him not mature yeah. he's obviously very mature I and mean, anyone who's going to claim that tolkien is not mature has not, not been paying attention yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah i mean because even the hobbit which was written for children is still yeah quite mature yeah absolutely in, in its themes and messages um you've got drama over comedy Drama tends to get more respect than comedy yes. does, and I think partly that's because people consider drama. And it's this weird attitude that humor is not adult. Like, it can, you know, you can have some humor, but adults don't laugh at things. Like, even we in this episode were joking about how immature we were being at the beginning. And, I mean, we were making jokes. There was nothing, like, hyper-immature about, yeah. like, 50% of it. So <laughs> <laughs> Our glee and tormenting Ross might be... And my glee and tormenting, tormenting kind of. me. Are yeah, you kidding that too. Me? Um, but yeah, children's stories tend to be unrealistically simplistic because we're trying to teach the more basic things before we get into the complexity. Parts of Clone Wars, Rebels, and Resistance all tend to be that way. Um, mature versions of franchise stories. So when you have you have an ongoing franchise like a superhero comic, for instance, that they decide to make something mature, tend to try to make everything seem more realistic than usual, whether or not it is actually realistic. That's that's one of the important things I found, is it's not that it actually is more realistic, it's just that we're trying to make it seem more realistic. So like Christopher Nolan's Batman movies. Yeah. Very, re you know, going for as high-level realism as you can get with something as absurd as Batman. Mm -hmm. And still not quite real, but There's definitely a... makes the suspension of disbelief easier than normal. There's a great Cracked video, Cracked.com, about... Bat Christopher Nolan's Batman series because mm -hmm. they're like oh yeah it's so realistic and the one guy's like well yeah you know except sure except Batman definitely had to murder some people and he's like what are you talking about he's like what you think Batman like built the Batcave himself and especially after the remodel like there were no construction workers he did it all himself so there's people out there well, who no, Alfred know helped him. <laughs> yeah and he's like so there are people who out there who know and they're like yeah well he could have you know paid him off and he's like sure and for, like, how long? What if somebody decides to, like, write a tell-all book and make way more money? Like, the only way to permanently keep people silent is Batman had to off, like, the entire construction crew. 
he, he could do it. I mean, he's rich enough. He can totally get away with it. He can do it. But we just... Batman had to kill kill some people, you know? <laughs> yeah. We're just getting a gloss over And it's just things. not yeah. realistic to think otherwise about that. Sure, yeah. And so, that, but they they definitely have a much more, like, you compare that to, say, uh, Tim Burton's Batman movies, yeah. which took refuge in stylistic absurdity. Yes. Like, that's that was very much what he was going for, is like, no, I'm not going to pretend this is real. It's stylized. It is, you know, I'm not, I'm not painting realism here. I am painting impressionism, and it's still like nobody's, I, nobody who knows what they're talking about at least is going to be like, oh, I'm sorry, impressionism is not as mature as realism. It's like no, I'm so that's a there's it's a respected, uh, respected uh, school of art for a reason. But so it's not necessary. I definitely feel like being more realistic is not inherently more mature in a lot of ways, at least like you can be like if we're assuming that to the more realistic we are, the more mature we are. That cuts out imagination that cuts out stylistic like choices, all this like there's so much so many schools of art. And so many amazing movies. I think as far as the discussion that realism is more mature, I think it touches on your point well like your point earlier of having real situations a more realistic style does point you in that direction but yeah it's not necessarily a yeah. well and and so then you also have so you have a lot of people who take that to additional extremes where you get you know you get the snootier like i don't i don't want to <laughs> disparage their choices like but you know you you Do argue it. with you i have had i have had arguments with english professors before where they're just like, uh, I had a, a big argument with one once where I was insisting, where I was just like, no, I really think what more arts, more, more English classes, at least in high school, if not in college, should do is include popular literature on their syllabus. Have the Hunger Games on there was the big one at the time that I used as my example. And I was, and she was just like, but that's not as literally, lit, literarily valuable as you know, all these other things that we've got on the syllabus, so what are we going to cut to make room for that? And I'm like, it doesn't matter what you cut to make room for that. If you don't cut to make room for something that people already want to read, you're never going to catch their attention on all those other things. You can try and hammer in all the importance on those that you want, but you're never going to, if you if you won't just sit down with them and discuss with, discuss with them what they like and show them how to delve into things when the, it's something they like, they're not going to delve into it of their own free will if it's something they don't like, like that's uh, I feel like yeah. that's why most English classes lose so many people. But you have a lot of people who go through those English classes and then come out going, "Oh, well, I'm sorry if your story does not comment on this, 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 that, and the other, and all these realistic issues, also in the way that I approve. Because if you're commenting in them on them in a way that I disagree with, then it's automatically trash and immature. There's yeah. a lot of that, but." Then, then it's not worthwhile, you know? Like, you can't just have escapism. You can't just have fun. That's all lesser. And I'm like, I would not call it lesser, possibly less mature, sure. But that's not a bad thing. Like, that's the, the C.S. Lewis thing. It's like, I have no problem with escape. I love escapist stories. I'm on a Star Wars podcast. Like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, what you saying there, Chris? <laughs> yeah. Like, I have no problem with those. Everybody needs escapism escapism especially escapism like star wars is something that is culturally tying billions of people together like this is a serious thing in so many ways to dismiss it as being less because it's not delving into all the issues that you want is itself immature in my opinion but yeah i mean that is that's like a kid being picky with their food is like well, because this isn't exactly what I want it to be, I'm not going to eat it. Because these are peas instead of carrots, I'm not going to touch the peas, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know, but it's just like, okay, well, but can't you just eat them, kid? Yeah. You know? Like, and Well, and, and what it often is for me is I, I look at it and it's like, it's a it's an experience where you've learned to enjoy different things. You know, it's like yeah. it's like with food where you can learn to enjoy things that you didn't enjoy before. When my when I first started eating sushi with my wife, I was not a fan of raw fish. I, I did not like the texture. I did not like the taste. Didn't touch that. I can eat it left and right now. I love it. It's not a problem. I've learned to like that. Um, I still don't go for the calamari. <laughs> but yeah, I've learned to, I, you know, my palate has expanded and that happens a lot with reading. But the problem yeah. is the more expa expanded a palate you get, the harder it is to enjoy the a lot of the older things that, you know, are more basic or more simple that you liked as a child. Yeah. And so, and that happens a lot with 
with media, with books and movies and uh, everything with literature, is you get a lot of people that are have so refined their palate that they don't realize that they've refined it to a point of, like, like past a point of uh, objectivity. Like, where, you know, it's like, I am only capable of enjoying something that d goes into this sort of depth in this specific way. Yeah, that fits in this little box yeah. over here. And there's not, and there's nothing wrong with that per se, but there's a lot of them that are so dismissive of anything that's not in their little box, even though someone else in a different box with an equal amount of schooling disagrees with everything they're yeah. saying, and they're both just like, oh no, but I am so educated, you have to agree with me, that's the only right way to agree. I be. think you just described academia? Yeah, there's a reason <laughs> I was never fond of it. Uh, yeah, see, and it's, I, I, I occupy this really awkward position where it's like, I feel like I have enough education on literature, and I mean, I've been editing people's writing for ten years now, I've got a lot of experience... And so you get a lot of people that are on that side of just like, oh, you have to have, you have to have a purpose behind this. You have to have maturity. You have to have realism. You have to have all this. And I'll be like, yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. Like, that's all great stuff. But then on the other side, you've got a bunch of people that are going like, oh, those are all pretentious dicks. And, you know, this, this, we all like this and there's nothing wrong with that. And I'm like, well, you're right that there's nothing wrong with it in a lot of ways. But like there's, there are strong points to both sides. And I don't think either side is right for dismissing the other one, but. But yeah, basically what, what those often boil oh, down to is right. like fun versus lectures. Like, there's nothing wrong with having fun. Nobody wants to be lectured all the time by their media. That well, it also, it reminds me of a, the, the stereotypical um, Trekkie versus Star Wars fan. Where they're like, yeah. they're so, you know, and, and when I say they, I mean both sides of this because yes. both are equally guilty of the, the stereotypical, right, sides yes. in these arguments that they they enjoy so much the things that that particular franchise offers that it excludes the other franchise and the good things that it offers. Yeah. You know, and we, we've talked about this before on the show, if you've somehow not heard that episode. We did a Star Trek versus Star Wars episode, and, like, there are good things and bad things in both franchises, and I like both of them yeah. quite a lot. I like Star Wars more, but Star Trek is great, you yep. know, and... I'm I'm glad that I am have not become so myopic that I can't enjoy Star Trek because yeah. of my love of Star Wars. Yeah, and see, and that's almost everything has some sort of value to offer. Like you know, I'm not picking up a lot of a lot of the media out there. It just doesn't engage me. There are a lot of books and stuff that I I'm just not like. Sure, that Twilight has anything to offer. Not even Twilight. <laughs> even Twilight has stuff to offer. Oh, I can't do it. But. Very generally, not to people in our age and gender range. Um, <laughs> generally, yeah, there are obviously exceptions, but yeah, no, there it has. Like Will to Forte offer, on Parks and Rec. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, there's it's. I mean, there's nothing wrong with lecturing with media. Like, there's nothing wrong with teaching and instructing, but there's also nothing wrong with having fun and stepping away from that, yeah. especially because sometimes people will learn better alongside their fun than they ever would have from a myopic lecture. Well, that's exactly, exactly true. Um, I think I was talking to you about this the other day, that, like, if you really, truly want somebody to take something to heart that you're trying to teach them, so much better to win their heart first and then be like, look, now that you like me, now that you're invested in what I have to say, let me impart some wisdom to you. Yes. Rather than being like, listen, you dummy, here you go, here's what you need to do, and you're bad and wrong yeah. if you don't listen to me and do what I tell you to. Like, yeah. one of those two is going to get a much better reaction and, like, a, a much more likely chance that they actually internalize the message, you yeah. know? And that happens with media, too. Like, if you get too lectury in your media... If you get too heavy handed, yeah. a lot of people, it's going to turn a lot of people off. And it's like, it doesn't matter. It's one of the, th it's a, something I come across a lot when I'm dealing with people who are like, no, but it's important that we get these things across and that we have a social responsibility. And I'm like, yeah, but your social responsibility is worth jack if you drive everyone you try to talk to away. If you cannot simply relate to people, if you cannot convey things without slapping people in the face and saying, you're all bad then you might as well not be trying at all. <laughs> and whether that was, whether this was intentional or there at all, um, 
is debatable, but Last Jedi, that was a major complaint. It is, is an issue. It is a felt, difficulty with Last Jedi. Is it, yeah. it feels very, it's, it feels preachy on it, social issues. Well, and, and it's, it's even more than that. Is it, it almost feels like an attack in many ways in, yeah. on a lot of the topics. And we're yeah. going to get into that in the Last Jedi episode. Yeah. But yeah, it's absolutely there. And, and, and sometimes it's, it's also a thing too, where you've got the flip side of that, that it's like some people, it doesn't matter whether or not you're trying to be preachy. It's just a question of, Oh, I've decided that this is what you're putting here and I am offended. It's like, I, I like, I like to use the example of Galaxy Quest where it's like, okay, Galaxy Quest has Sigourney. <laughs> That's a great show. <laughs> it is a wonderful one. It's got Sigourney Weaver's character who is the only female on the original cast of Galaxy Quest yeah. and she obviously suffered from some blatant sexism yeah. in how her character was written and portrayed and what they did with her. Yeah, definitely some objectification. Just, <laughs> just like happened with the original Star Trek that this yeah. is aping. And and Galaxy Quest, I feel, is not heavy-handed at all about pointing out that, yeah, Star Trek did this, and it wasn't good, yeah. and we're going to laugh about it and move on. It's nobody felt preached, or very few people, at least. I'm sure yeah. there were some people out there. There's someone out there who was looking at that and going, oh, you're trying to put women's issues into the... No, that is absurd. How dare you preach at me? And it's like, okay, no, no, that's not what was going on here. Yeah. And so every every issue has... You know, people can be very sensitive about those things. And so sometimes it's a question of how sensitive are you being? Are you being overly sensitive towards something that doesn't merit that amount of offense? Or are they just being heavy-handed and preachy? Those can both happen. And obviously it's going to vary per person who's as they're dealing with it. But maturity is complex. No. Um, <laughs> so, it, But when it comes to this, uh, you've got gra grays and versus blacks and black and whites, or another complex versus simple is another realism issue. And escapism and power fantasies versus the social critiques issue de delving and stuff. Humor in particular seems to be a point of contention to me. Like the way humor is used. Um, we've discussed before uh, bathos in storytelling is when you undermine a dramatic moment with humor. And for some people, like there's a, there's a range of how people can deal with bathos. Some people cannot handle any bathos at all. Like they just hate it. And some people just love it. They're fine with it. Like, I'm definitely on the I am I am all for bathos side of things, partly because that doesn't feel unrealistic to me. Undermining dramatic moments with humor is how I do. Like, that is <laughs> that is my life. I can and have made jokes at, you know, next to a corpse at a viewing. I can and have made jokes of every sort of inappropriateness ever. I nearly got smacked repeatedly from every side at my writing group the other day for making a punching pregnant women joke. Oh, and, <laughs> yeah. And, yep. And there, and we've got listeners listening to this who are just like, you did what? <laughs> just like several people in my writing group were. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, I don't, I, I got, I'm fine with, it. I'm fine with humor about almost anything, you know? And so I don't have a problem with that. Like the Marvel movies, we've discussed how yeah. bathos is every... It has infected those to a degree that even I agree that it is a problem. Um, but that's not as unrealistic to me. And I feel like that's why I don't have as much problem with that is because that is realism to me. But for other people who don't undercut dramatic moments with comedy, who wouldn't even think to do that, that's extremely unrealistic. And so when you do that, that throws them out of the story. And, uh, and so that's... And humor can, so because of that, humor can be really all over the place on whether or not people think it's mature or not. And so, like, I, I watched a video on Bathos on YouTube a while back, which I really enjoyed. And it was, uh, he had an example from Doctor Strange, from the movie Doctor Strange, where it's kind of the dramatic moment where he's gearing up for the third act, and he's in the bathroom and, like, throws the cloak over his shoulders and is looking at himself in the mirror, getting all psyched up or whatever. And then, and like, it's a classic movie, you know, moment we've seen in every superhero yeah. movie ever. And then his cloak starts, like, wiping his face for him. And he's like, stop. And he's, like, flicking it away from his face. And he's like, stop it. And it, it very much undercuts the drama of the scene. And this man in this video specifically referred to that as an example of this is, like, bathos used poorly. Like, it is undercutting the drama, drama of an important scene that's getting us psyched up for the third act. For me, though, I was watching that going... No, no, that's not bathos used poorly. That's bathos used well, at least in my opinion, because that was already an absurd scene. Like, this is literally a magical doctor in a hospital bathroom 
who is dramatically slow motionly flipping a really big cloak over his shoulders and then staring himself in the mirror while dramatic music plays. I was like, take away the music, take away the slow-mo. There's nothing dramatic about that scene. It is artificial drama. And that's what that bathos is undercutting. It's like, this is not a dramatic moment. Isn't this a little absurd? Aren't we all being a little silly here? <laughs> mm-hmm. And I, for me, that's that's perfectly appropriate use of bathos. It's like, let's undercut something that's not... Now, Peter Parker heaving himself, crying out of rubble in uh, Spider-Man Homecoming as the dramatic getting up for the third act moment. Now, that's dramatic. They did not undercut with that, that with bathos. I think they were wise not to, because that is a genuinely dramatic moment. Everything about that is tense and dramatic. And so that's one of the differences for me, is like, you've got artificial drama. Peter Parker as a goth dancing in a night? Oh, that is hyper dramatic. <laughs> that is so dramatic. Very serious business. Glad they didn't undercut that at all. Yes. <laughs> But yeah, that so that but so obviously for this guy that made this video, that scene he was buying that scene. He was on board with the drama of that scene, and so when it got undercut, it was a problem for him, and that was immature for him. For me though, I was watching that going, no, this was already immature, and this is just pointing that out, and that doesn't hurt my suspension of disbelief because I was already going, yeah, this is all silly. I'm gonna just consciously suspend my disbelief, and so you can't break my suspension of this. But the Guardians of the Galaxy movies get a lot of flack for this, too. Mm-hmm. You know, you get Guardians of the Galaxy 2 where you've got a giant stone... Um, what's his name? Wow, oh, I just blanked on the actor's name that played his Taika dad. Taika Waititi. No, no just Taika Waititi is awesome. <laughs> no, that played, uh, played Star-Lord's dad in that. He played Ego. Oh, uh... I can see his face. I yeah. know, right? I feel really <laughs> embarrassed that I can't remember his name. Patrick Swayze. There we go. Yeah. You got this giant stone Patrick... Is, was it Patrick Swayze? No. no, it wasn't Patrick no. Swayze. <laughs> now i got to look it up. I know. Pause. <laughs> Kurt Russell. Kurt Russell. Kurt Thank Russell. you. Okay. <sighs> All right. Thank you, Russ. So you've got this giant stone Kurt Russell, you know, barreling along dangerously and everything, and then you it pans and you get Pac-Man coming in from the other side to fight him, and a lot of people are just like, that's just dumb. Like, it just, it just undercuts the drama of everything, and I'm just like... It is literally a god planet with people inside him using his god planet powers to fight an avatar of him while a tiny tree tries to figure out how to explode a bomb in his brain. Like, why Why would this be serious? Why should it be serious? The Guardians of the Galaxy movies, for me, are actually some of my favorite examples of seriousness with a very... with of mature themes without a mature attitude. They're just like, no, we can make jokes, we can be silly, we can be ridiculous, but this is very much a stories about immature people becoming more mature, jerks learning to be nice, like jer- learning to be better people and coming together as a family. Like, I love all of that. That's all very mature. And none of the humor undercuts that for me because being more mature does not, you know, being more serious does not necessarily make you more mature. And a lot of silly people are still perfectly mature, in my opinion. And to be fair, this could just be me justifying all my life choices retroactively. <laughs> That's always possible. Um, but, so, but so in contrast, I it seems to me that the key to winning over a huge portion of the audience in a lot of popular media um, is works that take themselves seriously. If a movie takes itself seriously, then a good chunk of the audience also will take it, it seriously, even if whether or not it deserves to be taken seriously. Um... They will accept it as more realistic and therefore more mature. So like Rogue One is one of these examples for me. Rogue One is littered with things that for me, I was sitting there going like, you've, you're literally parading the characters in front of me one at a time so they can show off their combat skills, some of which will never be used again. Like this is straight out of a like teenage anime. That's not mature to me, but it takes itself seriously. So most people don't call it on its crap. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. But it is something I feel like people should be aware of. I feel like The Mandalorian kind of gets into the same category in some ways, where it's it's not that it's immature. I don't think either of I don't think Rogue One is immature necessarily. It has immature elements, but it's in in, in a lot of ways it's similar to what we've seen from Star Wars before. It's a, you know it's a a rogue but with an apparent you know kind of a heart of gold. He he hasn't been too cold or too hard yet. He's obviously got a bit of a soft spot for Baby Yoda, which who can blame him? So even cute. even Werner Herzog does. <laughs> but can you believe what happened to Baby Yoda in that last episode? I know it was horrible. Man. It's so sad. Horrible and or great. Yep. Yeah, that last episode <laughs> completely undercut everything I'm saying right now. Yep. <laughs> 
but you, you know you still get People a lot of so these <laughs> yeah you still get a lot of these tropes that are less realistic that are more like more escapist more power fantasy more fun instead of being the serious realistic gritty like or any of that stuff but it's got more of a veneer of taking itself seriously and so people do take it more seriously uh, episode three versus episode one and two like the writing hasn't really changed the plot points haven't really changed anakin's fall to the dark side is not really any more realistically plotted than anakin and padme's romance was <laughs> but it takes itself a lot more seriously yeah and it's the most loved movie of the three I, for me too like i'm not <laughs> i'm not trying to cast stones here like i absolutely love that more than the others and i know perfectly well that it was <clears throat> because it was taking more itself more seriously cutting out jar jar getting rid of a lot of that ridiculousness it makes it more seriously yeah. A lot of people seem to want Star Wars to grow up with them. I, I definitely was in that boat for at least a while. And it, in, to some degree, I still am. I don't mind seeing more mature things from Star Wars. But there's a lot of people that didn't realize the first time they watched Star Wars that all of this was immature. Or mm -hmm. that there was any immaturity or unrealism about it. And then as they get older, they want Star Wars to mature with them. They want the science to become more real. They want the the plausibility to become more real. They want, I wonder they want... if that's because of the age they watch it. You know, I mean, we yeah. watched the original trilogy when we were kids, and so in our minds we're kind of like, well, of course this makes sense. We don't think yeah, too much it always about did. it. You know, yeah, because yeah, it just makes sense to you when you're six and watching it, and then you get to be older and you're, you're a teenager watching the prequels and you're going, well, you know, okay, it's still pretty good, but there's this and that, and then as an adult. You're going, well, hold on here, episodes yeah. 7 and 8, just a minute I now. think it is a large part of why a lot of people have trouble is because they don't realize that what they're doing in their head is expecting Star Wars to grow up with them, even though it's never been that grown up. Like, it's not immature, I'm not saying that at all, but it's never been the most hyper... It, it is escapist fantasy, it's about having fun. And, and so then there's a growing trend these days, so you got a lot of stuff that take themselves seriously and therefore audiences take them more seriously but you flip that around there's a growing trend of stories that cheekily acknowledge that they're not realistic that they've got a silly history and and it kind of but have mature themes but they a lot of them can kind of irritate the people who take things seriously because they take themselves seriously if that makes sense so yeah. like tom king's batman is you know, circling back around hey <laughs> almost like i planned this so that was what I caught on when I was looking at this guy's review of time and like reading between the lines, picking out what he was complaining about here and there and trying to figure out what for him was immature about Tom King's Batman. And I think a large part of it, and this happens left and right with Batman, by the way, is that Tom King is not afraid to acknowledge that Batman is absurd. Like, he, you know, he's he's bringing in villains like Crazy Quilt and Condiment King <laughs> and Kite Man that have always just been absurd. And mostly he's using them for one-liners for gags here and there. Just, to, you know, they, they show up and then they disappear in a single panel even. And they just show up to get punched and moved out of the way. But their existence at all, for some people, is straight-up offensive. It's like, no, you can't, you cannot bring in all the absurd stuff into my mature Batman. Batman has grown up with me. It's serious now. And th as soon as you bring it, because, so like the Lego Batman movie got a huge amount of flack. Like a ton of fanboys really disliked it because it was so absurd. It was so silly. It was just ridiculous. It wasn't taking Batman seriously. And because it was being critical of Batman's being a loner and tough and strong and da 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 da. And it's like, well, that is all kind of absurd. And that's fine. As long as you acknowledge that this isn't necessarily realistic, but if you are insisting that something that isn't realistic is realistic to because it panders to your desires, to, to, towards your tastes, that's not really mature, in my opinion. Like, to, like, there's nothing wrong with liking things that aren't realistic, but I do think there is something wrong that insisting things are realistic when they aren't, because it's what you feel, because it's what you want. Like, that's a very teenager thing to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and so, and that's kind of what is so it, with, uh, with the new trilogy has elements of that too, that I think rub a lot of people the wrong way. So like light speeding through the planetary shield in force awakens <laughs> and then flipping the switch to stop the light speed just before you crash into the planet is absurd, like utterly unrealistic in every way. And I've said before, I kind of feel like they were doing that because they were just being open up front 
we are not going to try to make the new Star Wars scientifically realistic. Star Wars has never been that. We're not going to start now. Because that is, I think, the most glaring example of scientifically, like, a scientific lack of realism in Star Wars anywhere. Yeah. And, and I feel like they did that deliberately to just be like, hey, just so you know, we're sticking with what Star Wars has always been. Yeah. We're not going to mature it up randomly. I, that's kind of my opinion, but I feel like that rubs a lot of people a long way. Like, if if you acknowledge something's absurdity, like you have that moment in Last Jedi where BB-8 rides the chicken walker out into the hangar mm-hmm. and and Finn and Rose look at each other just like, <laughs> what? Yeah. And, and that acknowledging that this is absurd... <laughs> in the movie breaks a lot of people's realism they can't they don't like that and i'm i don't necessarily fault for people i don't want to come across like i'm attacking that it's like if you like what you like what you like that's fine it's just if this is what's going on maybe it'll be helpful to be aware of it um and that's a, the, the question i came down to pondering this is like is it more mature to pretend something is realistic when it isn't or to accept or even celebrate silliness and unrealism and that's a great question <laughs> yeah and, like, I feel like there is definitely maturity in being serious. I'm not good at it, yeah. but I, I can acknowledge that when other people are being mature at appropriate times, it is definitely mature. Well, I think there, it comes, I think it's an element of maturity to accept and acknowledge and embrace the fact that, like, there is a time and place for everything. Yeah. Even as an adult, like, there's a time and place to be serious. There definitely is. Yes. But there's also a time and place, even as an adult, to just be silly and yeah. and cut loose and be a kid again, you know? Yeah. And often the decision to do it in a place where someone else wasn't expecting it can be very jarring. Yeah. As with Poe at the beginning of Last Jedi. Like, that's not what you're expecting yeah. from Star Wars. And that's fine. Like, I don't fault you for that. It didn't rub me the wrong way because I don't take anything seriously. <laughs> and like I've, I've already <laughs> said, with the Marvel, I don't care if it gets a little Marvel-y because I, Marvel never wrong me the... Marvel never rubbed me the wrong way. But... Yeah. um. I often, I also think that part of the problem that happens sometimes is that because it's like, so you've got these two versions that are like a, a less mature core or we're, we're, it's still an escapist power fantasy, but with a veneer of realism over the top, like you get with say Rogue One. And then you've got the flip flop of that where it's like, this is a mature core, but you've got more absurdity over the top. Like you get with Tom King's Batman, for instance, that's acknowledging a lot of the absurdity. I feel like what happens sometimes with some people, uh, with the person that wrote that review I read about Tom King's Batman, at least, is that because the maturity is hidden under layers of silliness, or with the Lego movies that you get sometimes too, a lot of people miss it. Like, this guy's sitting here talking about how immature these Batman things are, and I was like, whoa, no, like, these are very mature. Like, the, the issues that this is addressing, the way it's addressing them, the complexity and the grays and all of this is very mature. But it kind of seems like he missed it entirely because all he saw was the surface level of silliness. Which even even the surface isn't that silly, but, you know. And and again, I'm, I'm making some assumptions about, uh, about what his reasoning was, but mm-hmm. that's the best I've been able to think of. Um, I think a lot of people are looking for an oddly limited kind of realism. Like, they want that, they want a veneer of realism that over the top of the same stories that they enjoyed as kids. They, and they don't want those stories to change in nature in any way. They don't want the stories themselves to grow up, just the style. And and so going and going back to that C.S. Lewis quote, I feel like it's kind of an unhealthy. Like they want they want validation. Like they want the things they liked as kids and still like as adults to be validated as mature. But they don't want them to change in any way. And you know, and personally, I'm just like, you know what? Star Wars doesn't need to be more mature. Like you, you're you're not yeah. immature for liking Star Wars. Nobody is. It's great. Star Wars is wonderful in so many ways. But I think that part of the reason a lot of people are so gung ho for like, no, I want more mature Star Wars. Part of the reason we're gonna we are going to eventually get people demanding a rated R Star Wars. Yeah. We want the Logan of Star Wars, is because they have this insecurity about liking something that is supposedly not as mature and so it's like no no make it mature for me but they still want it wrapped around that exact same less mature story that's my take on at least some of it um i thought that was pretty good well thank you thank you anyway so thank you for letting me get that out of my system because (laughs) holy crap it's been a long several months yeah 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 but i like and again 
don't want to fault anyone for liking what they like. Mm -hmm. I like maturity is a complex issue. I don't think I've necessarily cracked the code here in this podcast, but those are my thoughts. Well, that was really thorough, and as I anticipated, you articulated many of my thoughts <laughs> much better than I did. So I've had more time to prepare. That is also true. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thank you, Chris, for preparing that. Thank we, you. We hope you all enjoyed uh, listening to that. That I, I have a feeling that this is going to be one of those really popular episodes, yeah. like the death and the villains one, <laughs> like and, death yeah, and villains. The other, the other Chris's death, the other villains, Chris and maturity. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have a streak here of yep. <laughs> dark topics, I guess. It's because I'm so mature. Yeah. I only talk about You're dark, dark and things. gritty. Yeah. <laughs> actually, you have some stubble on your face. You might actually qualify as it's gritty. It's true. Shh, don't tell BYU. That. That's what I'm supposed to be shaving all the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, so be sure to follow us on Twitter, at More Civilized. And this is your last reminder to do the things that we've asked you to do for the ticket giveaway thing. The posts are pinned to the top of our social medias on Facebook and Twitter. So uh, Facebook, uh, so on Twitter, at More Civilized, Facebook, uh, a More Civilized podcast. I believe it's in the on the page and in the group as well. Um, yeah. So go there, do those things. And if you can't find it, just go in the group and say, hey, help me find this. Yes, exactly. One or two people do that. Yep. Yeah. And that's totally fine. We're happy to point you in the right direction. Uh, tell your friends about us if you like this podcast and if you have friends that like Star Wars and or if you have friends that like mature and gritty things yes, this our, episode for our sure. podcast is very mature and yeah exactly um, then tell them about it so yeah uh, and also don't be afraid to uh, rate the podcast on whatever yes whatever that is true iTunes is especially helpful it. yeah write us a review on iTunes shoot we should have made that one of the things for the giveaway dang it next mm. time next time oops yep oh well uh this week we have a favorite listener that we would like to point out uh his and or her and or their name uh is timball slash timbalara i'm gonna assume that's correct because it's both. i'm gonna go with timbalara timbal sure except it's the other way around and they have a slash in the middle uh we just really appreciated how much interaction we've got um, from this person through Twitter and and just their their prolificness in conversations and I think it's a he us. since he has guy in his bio on Twitter. There we oh, go. There you go. So thank you, Tim Ball, Lis- listening to us from all the way down in Florida. That's yep. right. Yep. Thank you, thank you, and keep it up. Uh, and if you'd like to speak with me. Not you, Tim Ball. Well, I mean, if you want to. But in general. Not you, Tim Ball. He you. doesn't want to hear from you. Yes. No, I do. <laughs> Please, someone talk to me. Uh, you can speak with me on Twitter, at Random Paladin, which I have not forgotten so far. Nice. Hey. I, I know for sure one of these episodes I'm just going to not think about it and give the old handle that doesn't work anymore. <laughs> yep. So, Random Paladin. Well, I mean, that's okay. Name. There's 68 episodes and like 10 Nerf Nuggets that all had that, so. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> What's uh, one more? It's true. <laughs> uh, you can find me on Twitter at itinerant Baxter, and I'm gonna do a thing, guys. Well, so Uh-oh. if you're you'll be listening to this, it's I will have already posted this in the Facebook group and probably on Twitter. Um, but I am we are doing a, another Last Jedi episode before the Rise of Skywalker airs, and I just decided, you know what? If I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do it right. So if you go to the Facebook group or the Twitter group, you will see that I have posted a survey there that you can click in and you can tell me what did we miss when we addressed The Last Jedi in Episode 6 concerning The Last Jedi, What you know, or what did we address that you feel we did not address thoroughly enough. So go back and listen to it. Yeah. <laughs> go and so go ahead. Yeah, please do listen to that episode first so that you can tell me where we are missing stuff. Because if you if you tell me like I want you this is a problem with the Last Jedi and I'm like no dude we totally address that then I'm I'm gonna ignore you but I would love to get as much feedback from people as I can because I want to address everything I can um, I may respond to you and say oh hey we covered that in this episode please go listen to that one and then tell me if that wasn't thorough enough for you um, but yeah you can find that in Facebook and Twitter share that with all your friends who have problems with the last mm. jedi i want to address it all so yep Ooh. that's gonna be fun <laughs> it might be a long episode oh yeah that's <laughs> going to be a long one because i was just thinking should we do something like like post that on reddit 
I don't know if I'm going to go that far, (laughs) but I am going to share it publicly on Facebook. Just be like, hey, whether or not you're listening to my podcast, go take this. Carl in my writing group. (laughs) Bring it, bro. (laughs) The glove has been, the gauntlet has been thrown. Yeah, come at me. I sense this is a discussion that has been had. No, really. That's the problem is that we haven't really discussed it much. Uh, I see. Well, there you go. Cool. And again, thanks for listening and may the force be with you. Always. Always. I'm Anna Graves, and thank you for listening to a more civilized podcast. (laughs) Uh, Fun fact, ever wondered why it's called the Iliad? Because Ilium was another name for Troy, and the ad suffix was used to mean the story of. This means that if you translate the title, the Iliad should actually be called Troy Story. (laughs) That one Fox Twitter account that's always interacting with us. Yeah. We've never, we've never shouted out to <laughs> no them. No kidding. Who is that? <laughs> you, you hate foxes or something, Ross? Yes, they're terrible. Excuse me, sir. Even in jest, that is not acceptable. <laughs> well. Foxes are the best. That's my Patronus. I'll have you know. Oh, is it? Oh, I see. <laughs> we'll put as much sa- we'll put as much noise into those six seconds as the Mandalorian put story into most of its episodes. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh, Chris. <laughs> <gasps> Saucy. <laughs> <laughs> you should definitely put Chris saying Patrick Swayze was Star Lord's dad in the outro. <laughs> no! Don't expose my wrongness. <laughs> I was less right. <laughs>